Good morning to you all. I'd like to draw your attention to our wonderful handbell trio. They will be doing a beautiful Lenten song to mock your reign, O precious Lord. Hello friends, if we've not met, my name is David. I serve as a senior pastor here, and I am grateful to be the first to welcome you to our worship gathering here today. If you are here for the first time, I hope that you are richly blessed by the time that we share together. And as we begin, I wanna encourage everyone here to do two things. First, if you've not already done so, I wanna encourage you to pick up one of our FYI guides. In this, you'll see a snapshot of all that's happening here in this month. 
I uh, would love for you to have that information. The second thing I'd love everyone to do is to fill out a connection card. Let us know of your presence here in worship today. You can do that by visiting our online bulletin. You can get there a couple different ways. On the back of our FYI guide, there's a QR code. On the seat back in front of you, you'll find that same code. It'll take you to our online bulletin. Or you can go directly there by visiting fmcm.org forward slash bulletin. This is a special weekend in the life of our church as we celebrate Pastor Sharon Reed, who is retiring from full-time pastoral ministry. For those who don't know, Sharon joined our staff here in 1993. And over the course of her many years of service, Sharon has faithfully served, blessed, and helped shape this congregation into who we are today. And so out of our deep appreciation that we share, I wanna encourage you to stop by the atrium at some point this weekend to express your thanks to Sharon for her service among us, for the way in which her faithful and fruitful ministry has been such a rich blessing to this congregation over the course of those many years. I wanna thank you again for being a part of our gathering today. May God be praised. May you be blessed as we worship together now. I know. <laughs> it's great to have you with us on this beautiful, sunny Sunday morning. My name is Scott. I'm going to be with you for this next hour as we do indeed worship together. Praise ye the name of the Lord together. We've got a great message by Pastor David as well. I just want to know, are there any Jesus lovers in the house? Yeah. I said, are there any Jesus lovers in the house? All right. Oh, how I love Jesus. Let's stand up and sing together. There is a name I love to hear. I love to sing His word. It sounds like music in my ear. The sweetest name on earth. Sing it out. again. Sharon knows how this goes. Come on. Come on, Sharon. I hope you brought your dancing shoes with you this morning, sister. Oh, she did. Check out these boots. Can we? Oh. St. Patrick's Day boots for the occasion. So my sister and I, we're going to hold hands here. 
and we're going to sing, Oh, How I Love Jesus, but we're going to have to sway, and you're all going to have to sway with us. Some of you look a little stiff this morning, so we're going to try to loosen you up just a little. Everybody do this. Whew. We're about, to, we're about to get moving in the spirit this morning. That's what happens when I get too much sunshine and fresh air in my bones. All right, that's what happened this whole week. I had a great week, so here you go. So we're going to be swaying like this. Everybody just do practice, huh? and then here, and then, yeah. Once you get it going, it just kind of goes, you know. So, all right, so, all right, here we go. Give it, yeah, oh, how I love Jesus, just a chorus. Here we go. Oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus. Stay standing. Don't sit down yet. Amen. Let us share uh, in these amazing words, these ancient words of faith, the Apostles' Creed. Please join me. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. God, I would have really been disappointed if you hadn't done that, you know, because either we're going to sing a cappella one more verse when I walk up, or now today is dancing. That's a whole new thing, so. Well, my name is Sharon, if we've not met. Um, I'm the one David was talking about in the video, so I'm retiring uh, from ministry, a uh, full-time ministry, and, uh, and, you know, I was thinking uh, earlier, I, I mentioned in the earlier service that 30 years ago, this sanctuary had not been built. I'm not sure it was even dreamed up at, at that point. And over 30 years, I've had the privilege, the blessing, uh, to watch what God has been doing through this church family. Um, certainly things have been built, but the reach of God's love around the world has multiplied in so many ways uh, and multiplied in this community. And so it's just been a joy uh, and a blessing to me uh, to watch what God has been doing uh, through all of you. And I know some of you have been here more than 30 years. Uh, so thank you so much for allowing me to be one of your pastors. As we go to God in prayer, um, I want us to, to take time to pause and think about the gift that God gives us. The gift of God's spirit that lives in us. And uh, to try to fully realize that. Uh, today as, as we prepare to hear the message and continue in worship. Uh, so will you bow with me in prayer? Gracious and holy God, we thank you for your faithfulness. And today, Lord, um, we just take in a deep breath and we let another one out. And as we breathe back in, Lord, we intentionally... Breathe in the peace that passes all understanding, the peace that comes only from you through your spirit. Lord, we, we are here to be changed today. We are here 
to listen to your word and to listen to your voice, the way that your spirit speaks to us. Because we know that you have not given up on us. And we're so grateful for that. We're so grateful for all the ways that you have blessed us. I am thankful for that for over 30 years. But Lord, what you have done is still unfolding, so magnificent. So we praise you and we thank you. We thank you for all the gifts you've given us. And Lord, we, we follow in the footsteps of Jesus in this. Jesus has taught us these things. And so now as we pray this prayer that Jesus taught us to pray, Lord, we invite you to help us see exactly what Jesus was teaching us. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Sharon. Let us stand and sing this great Charles Wesley hymn. You may not know, but the tune you'll know, He Wills That I Should Wholly Bleed. by Charles Wesley. You may be seated as we continue in this time of worship. I stand amazed.
What we all know is that life has a beginning and life has an end. There was a moment when we all took our first breath and a moment when we will each breathe our last. Yet central to the Christian faith is the conviction that being born isn't the same as being alive. There is a second birth which follows the first. When our eyes are opened, a seed of faith is planted. When our hearts first cry out, Lord Jesus, I surrender. I give my life to you. From this day forward, you alone will be my glory and my all. I desire nothing but you. But seeds are always planted with the hope that they will grow. It's one thing to be alive. Growing into full maturity involves so much more. And like each seed planted in the soil, real Christianity, seen in the life of one who is living in the assurance of the hope found in Jesus, whose faith is bearing fruit, whose love for all neighbors is present in every thought, every word, each action. This also involves so much more. And so we must ask, are we content with simply being alive? Or in all the moments that fall between our first breath and our last, are we willing to follow Jesus into the overwhelming beauty and joy of a life fully surrendered to Him. Well, welcome again. We are uh, grateful that you are here um, as we uh, continue in our, our, our season of Real Christianity, season three, and also as we celebrate uh, Pastor Sharon today. I have said in recent weeks that uh, I've worked along, uh, alongside Sharon for the last 18 years, and I've known her for 25 years, and, and this week I did the math, and that's not, that's not accurate. It's, it's more than 25 years. Uh, it's, I, I'm going to say about 29 years, so I've known her since I was about 15 or 16, I'm not going to tell you how old she was, but that was, that was what it was for me. And I, I want you to know that part of what we are celebrating today, in, in addition to her 30 years of ministry here, is that it was in this community of faith that the calling that she experienced in the very early years of her life, that calling was affirmed in this community of faith, uh, and Sharon said yes to that and entered into pastoral ministry as a result of the encouragement and affirmation of this congregation. And so we celebrate that today as well. And the reason I want you to know 29 years is because for me as a 15, 16 year old kid, uh, Sharon was for me what you have been for her. I don't know if I'd be in ministry outside of, of her friendship over the course of almost three decades, and, and that is not only true for me, I know that's true for many others in the way in which you serve and bless, and, and we celebrate that today as well. So uh, again, hope you'll stop by and express your thanks uh, to her for all that she has done as she, she moves into this, uh, this new phase of life in her, in her ongoing ministry. Uh, if you have your Bible today, I want to encourage you to open that to the book of Romans chapter 6. Romans 6 is where we're going to be. If you didn't bring your Bible with you, I hope you'll do so next week. And if you don't have one, we would love to give you a Bible uh, as our gift to you. Uh, you can go out these center doors to our connecting point if you're here in person. Uh, or anyone can, can send me an email and we will get that Bible uh, to you. Again, we're in the third season of Real Christianity. This started all the way back more than a year ago. Three seasons, each of which have been focused on a very simple idea. Becoming a Christian, season one, being a Christian season two, and in this third and final season, we're looking at maturing as a Christian. And we've also described this idea of maturing as experiencing deep change in your life. And my conviction, what I've shared with you along the way, is that I believe when people give their life to Jesus, when they have an encounter with him and surrender their life to him, that deep change is their desire. They desire to not only experience that in their life, but, but, but to be a part of seeing that realized in the world. But over the course of time, what happens for many of us is we fall back into a place that might be described in this way. We would say, I still believe in deep change, but I've settled for some change based on my assumption that there are many things in my life that simply will never change. 
And out of that struggle, we, we've, we've looked at this, this other question, this, this broader question, is when we think about deep change uh, in, in this life of living as a Christian, what's, what's the power of, of, of that change? What, what is the power that, that, that enables the, that change to be realized? And, and we've said there's really only two ways to answer that. It's either, it's either me or it's not me. It's either you or it's not you. And the conviction of real Christianity, the foundation of real Christianity, is that, that it isn't me. And that it isn't you. And that perhaps part of why we find ourselves in the place where we say, well, I still believe in deep change, but I've settled for some change because I assume that many things will never change is because we don't quite understand that power. We're perhaps a little bit afraid of seeing that power let loose in our life uh, or or in a more basic understanding. We just don't know how it works. How is it that the power that isn't me or isn't you begins the work Uh, in us, in me, and and, in you. The power of the Christian life, we've said, is the power of the Holy Spirit at work in our life. And so how is it that that power is let loose in our life and and enables us to experience change that we we never expected or or, or assumed could, could be realized in our life? So for just a moment as we begin, I want you to think about a place in your life, a, a behavior in your life, if you will, where you have found yourself fully convinced this is never going to change. Now, you don't have to share that with your neighbor. You don't have to write it down. But I want you to think about in your life, where is it, again, the behavior, the place where you've just found yourself, you're convinced this will never change. Uh, Maybe it's an anxiety in your life about a particular thing or just a general anxiety that that you live out each day. Maybe it's an addiction in your life. That, that you may know about, maybe some others know about, or no one else may know about this, this thing that you've struggled with for, for an extended period of time. Maybe it's a hurt that you assume is never going to be healed, a habit that's never going to be broken. Maybe it's a relationship that is fractured that you think is beyond reconciliation. I want you to think about what that might be in your life. That thing that you assume, you have become fully convinced, this is always going to be this way, this is never going to change. And I want you to just hold on to that. As we move through the message today, that, that whatever that might be, the thing in your life that you assume will never change as we look at Romans chapter 6. Now to understand what Paul is addressing here, I need to say a word about what he is addressing, uh, what we find right before this. In Romans chapter 5, which I'll summarize in one verse, this is Romans 5, 8, very familiar to many of you, but God demonstrates his own love for us in this, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. That's really the theme of everything that Paul is talking about in chapter 5. He's talking about that before we knew we had any need of him, Christ died so that he might meet us at at the place of our deepest need. This is the free gift of God made available by the mercy of God. What God has done for us that we haven't earned or deserved, it's what God has given, what God has done through Christ, God's grace in action through the cross. And so Paul is celebrating this, what what God has done. Again, this free gift. And as he moves into chapter 6, he's addressing one of the questions that he has heard as he shared this message throughout his life and throughout his ministry. The question is essentially this. If this grace is so amazing, why desire? Why would we desire to experience any change in our life? Why not use up this gift to the fullest? And here's how he expresses it in verse, uh, verse 1. He says, what shall we say then? Shall we go on sinning so that the grace may increase? Should we simply continue in this way of life so that our life can be an example of, wow, I'm still a mess and God loves me anyway. And he answers that question in verse 2 by saying, by no means. We are those who have died to sin How can we live in it any longer? Or don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. 
So a key word here in this section is the word baptism. When we think about baptism, we all often think of a celebration, which it is. Whenever we baptize someone here, we all clap and applaud. It is a moment of celebration. But, but Paul is using this word in, in the way that we see Jesus using it uh, in the Gospels. As Jesus talks about his baptism, not the one that, that, that begins his ministry, not, not the baptism that, that he receives by John the Baptist, Jesus uses the term, the metaphor of baptism to speak about his future death. He talks about it in two ways. He talks about it as a cup that he must drink, a suffering that he must endure, and he talks about it as a baptism that he will enter into the grave and he will be raised up into new life. It's why in verse 4, Paul speaks about being baptized into death. So just as Christ was baptized into death, in baptism, this is what Paul is saying, in baptism, you also experienced a death. You actually became someone new. Who you are is not who you were before. You have crossed over. You have stepped into. You have been raised into a new way of life. Who you are is not who you were before. You have experienced a death. This is what you've heard over and over again in that opening video. That, that, that From the perspective of the Christian faith, being born isn't the same thing as being alive. There is, a, there is a first death that we experience before the second one. There is a second birth that we experience after the first one. There is a new life that you have stepped into. And you can't go back to the life that you were living before. The other distinction, the way Paul distinguishes this in many of his writings is he talks about the old life as a life lived according to the flesh. The new life as a life lived according to the spirit. So look at verse 12 as we continue here. He says, therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body so that you obey its evil desires. Do not offer any part of yourself to sin as an instrument of wickedness, but rather offer yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life and offer every part of yourself to him as an instrument of righteousness. Verse 14, for sin shall no longer be your master because you are not under law but under grace. Law is a way for Paul to refer to the old life, the life lived according to the flesh. Grace is a way for Paul to refer to the new life, the life lived according to the Spirit. Jump down to verse 17. Thanks be to God, he says, that though you used to be slaves to sin, you have come to obey from your heart the pattern of teaching that has now claimed your allegiance. Verse 18, you have been set free from sin and have become slaves to righteousness. So let me see if I can illustrate what Paul is expressing here in this teaching. I want you to imagine that you make the decision to leave an old job in order to start a new job. And when you leave the old job to start a new job, you also leave the old boss in order to work for a new boss. Perhaps the main reason why you made the decision to leave the old job was because you wanted to leave the old boss in order to work for a new boss. Now, this is not to be taken literally, okay? So don't go to work tomorrow and say, my pastor told me to quit my job, okay? This is a metaphor, okay? So stick with me here. But you left the old job because your old boss was awful. Your old boss was terrible. They were a disaster. They were a tyrant in your life. Your old boss was someone who was constantly demanding things from you that were impossible for you to deliver. Your old boss was one who, who was consistently sharing unrealistic expectations of what you would be able to accomplish within a certain period of time. And, and on a regular basis, you found yourself falling short of those demands and those expectations. And every time that you did, the old boss delighted and the opportunity to remind you again of what a terrible employee you were. Did that hit home with somebody? I don't know, there, was, there wasn't a lot of laughter there. It was just, oh, whoa. Oh. So in this, you, you, you experience this to an extent 
that over the course of time, you actually became to believe the old boss. You were convinced that you actually were a terrible employee. So much so that you couldn't figure out why they hadn't fired you yet. But for whatever reason, your old boss wouldn't let you go. And then one day, someone walks into your office, passes by your desk, and says, you don't have to work here anymore. And at first, when you hear that, you think, well, this is it. <laughs> this is a very nice way for someone to say, you're fired, pack up your stuff. But, but it, that's actually not what it was. You don't have to work anymore was accompanied with, I want to invite you to a new job, to work for me in a, in a, in a new opportunity. And you were a little bit confused by that because, you, again, you were convinced. You were thinking to yourself, you don't understand. I'm an awful employee. I've been told that so much. But, but you, out of your desire to experience something different than you had before, you packed up that desk and perhaps with a little bit of skepticism thinking that <laughs> this person doesn't really know what they're getting into hiring me, you, you moved to a new job and you began to work for a new boss. And here's essentially the argument that Paul is making. You're at your new job. You're working for your new boss. And your old boss walks in. And Paul's, Paul's question, what, what, what he's lifting up here is this idea, why in the world, at your new job, working for your new boss, would you assume that your old boss would have any authority over you? What in the world would lead you to believe that you still have to listen to anything that that old boss might say? Maybe that old boss would come in and share the same demands and the same expectations and, 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 and doing so would also share the same words of, of belittling you as for being the terrible employee that, that, you, that they've seen you be over the course of time. But why in the world, Paul is asking, in your new job, working for your new boss, why would you think that your old boss has any authority over you, ha has any right to speak in, in, into your life because you don't work there anymore. You don't work for them anymore. You've moved into something new. Now, now every, every illustration breaks down at some point because you haven't just left an old job in, in order to take a new job. You've actually left an old life and you've stepped into a brand new one. You've stepped out of a life that was driven by the demands of the tyrant that you worked for. And you have been drawn into your new life that is fueled by the promises of the one who has said, I will fill you with power. Now you may think to yourself, well, I believe that. I mean, that's not anything new for me. I understand what Paul's saying here about the old life and the new life and the idea of an old boss and, and a new boss. Again, I, I still believe in deep change. But over the course of my life, I've settled for some change because I just assume that many things will never change. But here's the problem. We all know someone who has experienced deep, radical and miraculous long-term change in an area of their life that no one, including them, thought could ever change. We all know someone who is, we might say, the exception to the rule. They have experienced in their life a deep, radical, miraculous, long-term change in the area of life, the specific area of life that no one thought would ever change. Let me give an example, because I know some of you are looking at me like, I don't know, I don't think I know that person. Let me give you an, an example of, of, of where that, that change has happened, perhaps in, in the lives of someone that you, that you know. So if you, if you come here on Thursday night, 6.30 p.m., we have a worship service that's called Restoration Community. And Restoration Community is formed around, it's really defined by, built on, the 12 steps. Now, you may have heard of the 12 steps before. The 12 steps uh, were outlined by Dr. Robert Smith and Bill Wilson in 1935 in the establishment of a new organization known as Alcoholics Anonymous. 
Now again, you may have heard of the 12 steps. You may be familiar with this concept. You may know that over the course of almost 100 years, these steps towards recovery that were really directed to a particular addiction, what, what, what they've seen, at, what, what has been observed is they, they've helped with all sorts of addictions. They've helped people experience all sorts of recovery beyond an addiction to a substance, but, but, but healing from, from hurts in their life. Restoration community is built on the idea that everyone is recovering for some, from something. It's not just for those who are dealing with an addiction to a, to a substance. It's for those who seek to experience restoration and recovery in their life. You've probably heard of these steps before, but I bet you don't know all of those steps. So let me just walk through those with you so that you can know what, what, this, is, what this is based on. This is, this is as they were originally written in 1935. Step one, we admitted we were powerless over alcohol, that our lives had become un unmanageable. Step two, we came to believe that a power greater than ourselves could restore us to sanity. Step three, we made a decision to turn our will and our lives over to the care of God as we understood him. Step four, we made a searching and more, uh, fearless moral inventory of ourselves. Step five, we admitted to God, to ourselves, and to another human being the exact nature of our wrongs. Step six, we're entirely ready to have God remove all these defects of character. Step seven, humbly asked him to remove our shortcomings. Step eight, we made a list of all persons we had harmed and became willing to make amends to them all. Step nine, made direct amends to such people wherever possible except when to do so would injure them or others. Step 10, continue to take a personal inventory and when we were wrong, we promptly admitted it. Step 11, sought through prayer and meditation to improve our conscious contact with God as we understood him, praying only for knowledge of his will for us and the power to carry it out. Step 12, having had a spiritual awakening as a result of these steps, we try to carry the message to alcoholics, this message to alcoholics and to practice these principles in all our affairs. Now, if, you're, if you've never heard of those steps before, if you've never heard them outlined, perhaps right now you might be thinking to yourself, that sounds familiar. That actually sounds like the gospel. That actually sounds like what the Christian faith is all about. Beginning with this admission that we're powerless turning our lives over to God, humbly asking God to bring about transformation that we could not do for ourselves, being those who are willing to make amends to those that we have harmed, to continue to take a personal inventory of our life, to, to continue working in community with others, to, to, to stay in, in a new place, to, through prayer and meditation, to connect with God that we might know his will for our lives and, and we might be filled with the power to carry out that change. So, so I don't want you to miss this the basis of AA is this idea that the power to change your life begins with admitting you lack the power to change that is a ridiculous and illogical idea it doesn't make any sense that the power to change your life begins with admitting that you lack the power to change in other words over the course of almost a hundred years Millions of people who wanted to get well. Millions of people who had been told by family and friends that their addiction would one day kill them. And millions of people who actually agreed with family and friends that this addiction in their life would one day end their life and who over the course of an extended period of time lived with this fear that their life would never change, embraced that greatest fear that they could not bring about the change themselves. They had the courage to confess, I don't have the power to do this. 
And it was that confession that enabled an initial release from that bondage, and it was their ongoing participation in this way of life and the community of people that were sharing this life together that led to their ongoing freedom from something they expected would never, ever change. You may not know who they are, You may think to yourself, I don't know anybody who's experienced it in their life. Well, here's one of the reasons that you don't. And this is really not meant to be funny. It's called Alcoholics Anonymous. There are people in your life who have experienced this change. Their life was heading to complete destruction. And out of taking these steps, they experienced a transformation that no one ever expected what happened in their life. As I was uh, doing some research on AA, I ran across this criticism of AA. It was described as a cult that relies on God as the mechanism of action. What a great compliment that is. Wouldn't it be incredible if the church was criticized in the same way? I don't know how I feel about the cult part. But imagine that they caught the rest of it. That these are people who are crazy enough to believe that God is the only, only source of power to bring about transformation in their life. So for just a moment, I want you to bring back to your mind whatever that thing might be in your life. Again, you've given up. You have fully embraced hopelessness. This is never going to change. And let me just ask you this question. If that could change, what else might change? If by the power of the Holy Spirit, what you believe is impossible actually becomes possible, then what else is possible? If the power of the Christian life is the power of the Holy Spirit in your life, if, if, if you were to grow in your partnership and the understanding of this power in your life, letting it loose in your life, what might be possible that right now you can't even imagine being realized in your life? Here's the question I want you to wrestle with in these next few days, because this is where we're going next week. This is kind of my tease for next week. As you think about that power, maybe the question we should ask ourselves is this. Just how powerful is this power? How powerful is the power of God? How powerful is the power of God? Whatever it is that you might lift up as the thing in your life that you, you cannot help but believe this is never going to be any different than it's been all along. How powerful is the power of God to bring about that change? In the place of utter hopelessness, what might it look like for hope to begin being restored? That's the gospel. That is the true aim of the Christian life. That is why Jesus came. And that is what the Holy Spirit can do in you and do in me. Will you pray with me? Holy and loving God, together we share this confession that we are all tempted to revert back to the belief that our addiction our brokenness, whatever it might be in our life, we, have a, we, we fall back in the belief that it is more powerful than your power in our life. And we repent of that. And we pray, Lord, that you would enable us by your power to begin to see what life might look like on the other side of that. That we, Lord, in the very place in our life that we have stamped as impossible, we might begin to imagine what a miracle might actually look like and the kind of life that we might live when we live in your power at work within us. Today, Lord, I pray for those in this room who have 
it's easy for them to identify what that area is. It may not be any something it may not be something that anyone else knows. But they know. And in that place of hopelessness, Lord, I pray that you would begin the process of restoring hope. That today they might be encouraged and perhaps empowered to talk about that with someone in a way they'd never talked before. And in that, Lord, new life might come as a result of your spirit at work in their life and the lives of those around us. May we be a community of faith, Lord, that might be known as a place uh, where, we, where people gather who are crazy enough to believe that only you, only you can transform us fully and completely. All this we pray today in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. And the people of God said, amen. We've not had the opportunity to meet. I'm Pastor Don, one of the pastors who serves here and is blessed by that privilege. And as we've come together this morning, we have heard God's word, we have sung it, we've experienced it, and the Holy Spirit is present among us. And when those things happen, one of our immediate reactions is gratitude. And so at this moment and this time, there are ways that we can express that gratitude to God. Uh, ways that we can participate in offering and gifts to God. And you will see those on the screen and the ways that we could do that and uh, electronic, uh, the normal means, boxes at the back, all of those things. And I would encourage us to join together in doing that. Because when God has done what he's done today, it just has to be, we just have to say thank you. And also, I would encourage you, this morning as you came in, if you didn't pick up one of these uh, FYI guides for March, there's important information here about things coming up and opportunities and possibilities and all the way into Easter, and I encourage you to pick this up for your edification, but also I want you to pick one of these up, at least one, because I'm betting that you know someone who needs to hear this, who needs to see these opportunities. And there's also one just for our gathering together on Easter weekend. And so it, what a wonderful blessing and privilege it would be if we took those and gave those to those around us we love as a way of saying, you can, God can, there's hope. See, he was raised from the dead. Nothing is impossible for God. And God's love for us says there's nothing impossible for us. Amen. We began this morning proclaiming our love for Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus. Why? Because he first loved me. We thank you, Pastor David, as well, for that inspiring message for those of us who have been transformed and are in the process of being transformed by the Holy Spirit we also have a duty to send the light into our community. We thank Pastor Sharon for being a light for almost 30 years here. And we know that uh, wherever she goes, she will bloom where she is planted. She will be bringing the light of Christ to all that she sees and knows. Let us stand and sing, send the light. There's a call comes a ring and all the restless way send the light, send the light. There are souls to rescue, there are souls to save, send the light, send the light, send the light, the blessed gospel light, let it shine from shore to shore, send the light, the blessed gospel light. Let it shine forevermore. Let us pray that grace may everywhere about send the light, send the light, and a Christ-like spirit everywhere be found. Send the light, send the light, send the light, the 
blessed gospel light, let it shine from shore to shore. Send the light, the blessed gospel light, let it shine forevermore. Let us not grow weary in the work of love. Send the light, send the light. Let us gather jewels for a crown of us. Send the light, send the light. Sing it out. Send the light, the blessed gospel light. Let it shine from shore to shore. Send the light, the blessed gospel light. Let it shine forever. Amen. Before, uh, before we leave, let me invite you to be seated for just a moment. Uh, and I want to invite Pastor Sharon to come up, uh, our other pastors who are here today. Uh, we want to say a prayer of blessing over her. Uh, so Sharon, if you want to kneel right here, I also want to invite her family uh, to come up as we share in this moment. And then I also want to say anybody else who wants to come up as we lay hands on her and pray blessing on her, you are invited. Uh, we'll just, just come on in. We'll make a big old circle around her as we pray for her. Lay some hands on you don't all have to come, but anybody who wants to come is welcome to come. Because I know there are many here who want to. So we'll give a moment for you to gather. You know, one of the gifts uh, that Sharon has, which you saw, I'm always amazed what Scott will get you to do. Yeah. <laughs> Y'all were swaying just a moment ago, and, and I know some of you were thinking, I don't want to do this, I don't want to do this, but everybody else is doing it. That's one of the gifts that Sharon has. She does it in a very different way. She gets you to do what she wants you to do. <laughs> uh, 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 stop, stop laughing, Mike. And in doing that, she convinces you that it's what you want to do. <laughs> And that is one of the ways that she has blessed so many. It's by inviting them into a life with Jesus uh, in, in a way that, that others could not. And so we want to again say a prayer of blessing over her uh, for all that she has done over the course of decades here in the life of this church. So would you pray with me? Good and gracious God, we pause together this day to celebrate the faithfulness of this, your servant. We give you thanks for the call you planted in her life long before she knew this could be her life. For all of those who nurtured that call, who affirmed her gift and encouraged her to pursue this dream you had for her, and for her courage to say, here I am, Lord, send me. To you be all glory, honor, and praise for the good work you have done in her and the rich blessings so many have received out of the overflow of that work. We give you thanks for her family who have walked this journey with her. We pray your blessing over each of them. We pray your blessing over her husband, Ron, her, her children, Brad, Matt, and Chris. And we pray blessing upon blessing to be poured into her as she enters this new phase of life and her ongoing ministry to you. From our heart and most especially from yours, we pray, Lord, that she might hear in the depths of her soul these words, well done. Amen. Well done. Well done. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and all God's people said, Amen. 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 You can clap now. So, Eric... Eric is bringing one of the gifts that we have for you. And Sharon, we want to give you just a minute so that you can get to the atrium. And family, y'all are welcome to join her as well so that she can greet you. So as she, uh, as she makes her way there, let me ask you to stand and uh, hear these words of benediction as we go from this place. May you go in grace and peace. May the God of all hope and mercy and grace go with you. May you go filled with the power of the Holy Spirit to make disciples of Jesus Christ who love God, love others, and serve the world. Go in Jesus' name. Amen.